today is August 16th, 2021, and we are recording for our August 18th show. I'm Trey Dobson, Chief Medical Officer at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and an emergency medicine physician with Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. And this is Medical Matters Weekly, the show about the aspects of healthcare that matter to you most. The topic of our show today is ensuring equitable access to care for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, especially during COVID-19. And we're always weaving in COVID-19 right now. This is a perfect example. My guests today are Patricia Johnson, a registered nurse at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center in our emergency department, and Caitlin Tilly, also a registered nurse, a former emergency medicine nurse, or actually continuing to still work, but she is also the director of Transitions of Care. Welcome, you guys. We're so happy to have you. Thanks, Thanks Mary. Kaylin, are you still working shifts in the emergency department? Um, not so much. I think the last one I picked up was at the beginning of um, COVID, but I do still continue to see um, our sexual assault cases as they come through. That's right. That's great. Thank you so much. So a little bit about their background, and then we'll get into the topic of the show. Uh, Patricia has worked at SVMC since 2016. Uh, she's the director of nursing for the recovery house in wallingford and a long list of other things a master's in leadership from springfield college associates in nursing from vermont technical college and has worked in social work and education roles uh, as a licensed nurse assistant since 2006. caitlin has worked at svmc since 2014 i believe a chair of the health systems diversity and inclusion committee uh, has a bachelor's in nursing from Southern New Hampshire University and is enrolled in Southern New Hampshire University's MBA program for healthcare administration. Gosh, Caitlin, when are you going to finish that? Oh, soon, but probably within the next year or so. Wow, that's a lot of extra work. Um, so uh, let me just start. I'm going to start. I'll start with Patricia, and I just want to get a little bit of uh, your background for the audience, so they get to know you. Uh, just tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how you got to where you are today. Sure. So welcome everybody, and thank you, Trey, for having me on the show. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. <clears throat> Believe it or not, I was born in this very hospital. Oh, wow. I did not know that. That's awesome. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I was born here, raised here, uh, attended Sacred Heart School, went to high school, uh, decided to go to UVM, switched to uh, Southern Vermont College, where I graduated with a degree in criminal justice. Um, I then be began to work um, contracted jobs for the state, DCF, Department of Corrections. Um, and I found that there wasn't enough um, resources in our community for some of the tasks to be completed um, the way that I would would like to help work with people. So um, I began working with some blueprint nurses um, on the care teams. And one of them said, you know, the best opportunity is to get into nursing. You can have hands-on opportunity for change. And um, $100,000 in debt after my master's degree, I told my parents, please bear with me one more time. I'm going to make another uh, <laughs> career leap. Um, and it was the best decision of my life. Going to nursing school had immediate, um, immediate impact on my life. It gave me freedom. Uh, it changed my socioeconomic status. Um, I was able to spend more time with my kids. Uh, I really felt like I was strengthening the community one patient at a time. Um, <clears throat> I did start off as an LNA and then uh, worked my way up to an LPN and then uh, became an RN. And all of that was possible because of funding that we have here at SVMC. Uh, so uh, it was a ladder program uh, where I got tuition reimbursement and I attended Vermont Tech uh, to get all those credentials, which is a local um, school that we have here for nursing in Bennington. It wasn't easy, but um, I have to say that um, I have a lot of supports here uh, within our uh, hospital community. A lot of people that I can call on as family. Uh, I got pep talks. <clears throat> Caitlin is one person who took me under her wing very a, a lot of times. Um, one time that sticks out is a EKG reading. I was really struggling with telemetry and she was like, Patty, you're going to be an NR, uh, a emergency nurse. You've got to do this. And so she would just 
take me to the side and we would hit the books. Um, but lots of great mentors, uh, leadership in the emergency department from Lori and Jill, um, just doctors uh, checking in on me, making sure that I was um, still in good spirits and um, making sure that you know I was going to get to pursue my dream. And this was one of the biggest accomplishments of my life. And I have to give credit to our SVMC community. Um, I would not have gotten this far without you guys. It's well, truly a blessing. I mean, you just gave a great uh, explanation of why those who are considering careers in healthcare, uh, nursing, and many other uh, healthcare worker fields uh, should do so. You used a term that, uh, or a phrase that I haven't heard before, and I love it uh, hands on opportunity for change. Um, that is uh, one of the benefits of what we do. We get to directly work with people and see the change and see the outcomes, which really is important for your own uh, well being and for your mission driven values. So, Caitlin, tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up in nursing. So, I uh, share a little bit of similarities to Patty. So, I, bo I was born and raised in Bennington. Mm -hmm. um, finished my high school career out here, um, graduated from high school uh, from Mount Anthony, and uh, two of my dad's sisters are both nurses, mm -hmm. and they wanted to push me into nursing right out of high school, and I was like, that's like the last thing I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, and so I ended up working in uh, veterinary medicine for a couple of years, um, and was pursuing that as a career path, and ended up with some pretty significant allergies to most animals. Oh, um, so I had to kind of last minutes, uh, kind of decide what I wanted to do because that wasn't an option. Right. Um, and so I ended up, you know, was fortunate from that experience to have exposure to a lot of different aspects of medicine because uh, veterinary professionals do a little bit of everything. Um, they do general practice, you're doing radiology and you're doing your own blood work and surgery. And so it was a really good opportunity. And I was like, you know, I, I'm really enjoying this. And so uh, I had to then admit to my aunts that they were both right uh, <laughs> as I, I went into nursing school. Um, and so I've been doing that. This is my 10th, 10th year as a nurse. Um, so it's been a decade um, and I've kind of been all over the place. I left um, Bennington when I finished nursing school and worked in the capital district area for a couple of years starting out my career. Um, and a few years in, decided that I really wanted to come back to Bennington um, and my home community. And I think that there are some things that are were a little bit off-putting to me, like, oh my God, I'm, how am I going to take care of people that I've known my whole life? And I think that that has been um, probably the best part about my job is that I do know the people that I'm taking care of. And I can't tell you how many times I've, you know, having worked in the emergency department most of my career here at SVMC, having people come in and seeing a familiar face um, in a time of crisis uh, has really impacted me from a professional standpoint. You know, it makes me know that I made the right decision to come back home. And then you, you both have involved uh, in, into working with those uh, and that have had inequalities in healthcare. When did you first realize there were these disparities? And, and Patty, I'll ask you first, when did you realize there were these disparities uh, in healthcare? Because Ideally, there shouldn't be any, you know, we, uh, we should be uh, blind servants who are providing health care to the best of our abilities. And unfortunately, that's uh, not always been the case. Sure. So <clears throat> I, though I have uh, been uh, wrapped up in, in wonderful, uh, a wonderful care team with my education, um, I feel that there are other uh, nurses of color that might not have had that opportunity. Um, this is a great uh, family and here at SVMC, um, and I feel as if uh, a lot of people saw no color, but also did recognize the importance of, uh, of me obtaining a nursing degree and what type of uh, benefits I would gain for my family. So I do feel uh, like, um, people wanted to see me do well and uh, were willing to um, take time out of their lives to support me. Um, there is a mentorship group of women of color that are nurses in the state of Vermont. They oftentimes check in on me, make sure that um, I'm feeling supported uh, <clears throat> and that um, 
you know, I advance my leadership skills. Um, the sky's the limit. Um, and mostly to hone it back into your question, when we first started seeing COVID, um, I saw a divide. I saw um, hesitancy uh, for people of color to uh, seek treatment. Um, I also saw that in rural Vermont, we have a lack of primary care. So we also had people who were um, susceptible to comorbidities, people of color, um, not really knowing that they had diabetes or not understanding mm -hmm. that uh, they were hypertensive um, or had um, an issue with addictions. Uh, there's lots of stigmas for people of color surrounding mental health um, and the medical world. Um, and I believe that SVMC has understood that, we're addressing it. Uh, we know that there's social disadvantage and that's why we are hitting the ground running. Uh, Caitlin and I are the foot soldiers to get into the community to make change happen. Um, as nurses, <clears throat> we're in the perfect environment for catalysts uh, to inspire cultural awareness and health equity changes. People want to be cared for for those who look like them. They want to believe um, what you're saying, so to speak, but some of the things that have happened in the past um, can leave you leery. And we don't need to get into all that uh, right now. P people are uh, fully aware that there have been uh, trials and um, other harms done to people of color in the past, medically wise, that can lead them to uh, not trust the healthcare system. And we're the ears and the eyes for the patients. And that puts us in the role of advocacy. So we want to meet people where they're at. It can be small bits of education. Education is the key to, to knowledge. Um, you can't care for yourself if you don't know um, what what's going on. So um, small conversations. Um, we have the Diversity and Inclusion Task Force. Um, we have uh, little educational pieces where we, if, if patients come in and I notice they're a person of color, I go over. I, you know, I, I, I target and I say, hi, my name's Patty. I live in the community. How are you? Um, you know, I see that you're here for blah, 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 blah. How can I help? How can I help you? Let's make a connection. Um, starting walking groups or um, just talking to people about their diagnoses so that they understand how important it is for them to be connected with our community here at SVMC and that we're here for them and that good change will happen with um, health education and sticking and adhering to um, the medical regimen that uh, is being prescribed by their doctor. So Caitlin, let me ask you to expand on a few things. Patty talked about, I'll use the word negligence, just gross negligence in the past. And, and uh, it is important to understand that and study that uh, so that we can be acknowledgeable and also aware so we can um, plan for the future. But also we really want to know right now what's going on that we can focus on uh, so that we're not too um, much in the past. We can say what's going forward. So what do you see as the scope of the problem today and I imagine it varies uh, both geographically and with other um, uh, differences in where people receive health care. And I didn't really ask a question, so how about you just describe what you see as the scope of the problem? Yeah, um, I think I have a lot of similar thoughts as Patty on this, and it's, it's probably why we've worked together on a couple of different initiatives over the past year. Right. Uh, but I think, you know, coming back to your first question to Patty about sort of when did you start to think about inequities in healthcare? And I mean, that that's sort of the what pushed me to leave emergency medicine and work in transitional care with Billy Allard. Um, you know, I was in the emergency department working night shift for God, five years and we're such an instant gratification specialty. Like you're sick, we figure it out, we fix you and, and treat you. And I was starting to be really overwhelmed by the amount of things that I couldn't fix in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. um, people who are homeless coming in and... Nope, we lost, you, lost know, you, Caitlin. With people and have a, am I still lost? Nope, no, you're back. Okay. <laughs> you're, you've been found. Um, I was gonna say, once you start, start to build those relationships with your patients, 
and they feel like they can disclose sort of what the root cause is, you start to find out that they're not in the emergency department in the middle of the night because they have back pain. They're in the emergency department in the middle of the night because they're homeless, it's cold out, and they really don't have those connections in the community to address those issues. And so they know that the emergency department is a safe space to come and warm up, get something to eat. And and I started to kind of be really interested in this, you know, how can we change the systems and not just treat the problem? Um, it, it has always felt a little bit reactive to me and I wanted to figure out a way to more proactively address some of these things. And so then I met Billy and um, the first time I met Billy and had that conversation with her about sort of tell me a little bit about what you do and, and what you've accomplished here. I, was, I knew this was my spot. Um, and so I think exactly what Patty said that once we start looking at adding a pandemic on top of everything, it's that push that some of us needed to prioritize things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I started looking at the data that was coming in with the pandemic and looking at the numbers of and how this was impacting the BIPOC community. And that was when I made the decision that I'm not just going to kind of passively stand by and, and figure out, you know, people will get vaccinated when their time is. And it's, you know, I wanted to figure out a way to proactively get out there and make a difference with a problem that I was seeing. And so that was where um, Patty and I connected to kind of figure out what strategies could we implement and who did we need to partner with to um, get vaccines out to the community. And I know that Patty will have much more to say to this than I do because she did a lot of the legwork, but um, making those connections, having those conversations, um, you know, it's sort of like the elephant in the room, but it means not a whole lot coming from me as a white person saying like, I want to help you because I don't have that lived experience as a person of color. Mm -hmm. um, and so Patty was able to kind of be that spokesperson for the community and really connect meaningfully to say, hey, you, you know, we really need to kind of think about this and these are the risks and how can we help you so that you can feel a little bit safer um, seeking seeking care, seeking treatment, seeking vaccination, and you know, starting to build those relationships so that we can get people established with primary care providers so that these inequities that come down to things like undiagnosed diabetes and hypertension, like Patty was talking about, we can start to build those relationships with our patients and really impact that change. So for, for you both, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but um, going a little bit off cue, you, you just brought up something. I've, I've wondered a lot, why did COVID-19 um, expose to uh, many people who were not aware um, of this disparity? And so I'll just give you a, a couple things that have crossed my mind. Sometimes it's just social, social maturation, right? Which is, I think, a made up term I made up once. But social maturation, meaning it was at the right time uh, to uh, raise the awareness and it was the right event to raise the awareness. But there's got to be a little bit more uh, behind that. So I don't know, Patty, do you have any thoughts about where the pressures of COVID-19 sort of exposed this? For, for many people, um, of course, they already knew this. They've known it for decades uh, and they've been trying to raise awareness. Uh, but it wasn't until you know the past 18 months that it's um, sort of come to the forefront of the media. Great. Trey, I mean, it was no secret that the pandemic was disproportionately affecting uh, underserved communities. And in rural Vermont, we had data that people of color were dying almost two and three times more than uh, people who were not of color. Right. Um, and part of that is socioeconomic status, uh, the workforce, the, the jobs that they had um, being essential workers, um, and um, living in multi-generational family homes, um, and um, health equity and health literacy. Um, and I know that we need, we were saying herd immunity, but what does that mean? Mm -hmm. uh, what what does that mean to people? To, to, um, so you you have to legit have the conversation with people that this vaccine was created by people of color. It's not something that just popped up. It's been in the works for a long time. It's trustworthy. Um, model the behavior of getting the vaccine and why um, 
even if you got COVID after getting the vaccine, it would decrease your chances of being hospitalized, uh, stress the importance of uh, family and, um, and keeping each other safe. If you're not gonna do it for yourself, maybe you'd like to do it for your grandmother who's uh, more susceptible to um, catching uh, the virus because she's got a suppressed immunity. So it's really just making some things uh, less selfless and more community-based or family-based. Um, people of color uh, have strong ties to the church religion. Um, so holding things in a church as we held the, uh, the NAACP um, and um, Vermont Department of Health chose the location of a church. Um, it's a safe place. Um, and that's, um, that's one thing that we did to be culturally sensitive to uh, the population that we're serving. All right, so you actually, it, you know, for the audience here, this was administration and availability of vaccination uh, in different locations. And then you talk about awareness, um, which is so important in that communication. Um, it, it sounds like you're getting out there in the field um, as opposed to what we're doing right now, which is we're sitting in our offices, but we're trying to communicate. Uh, but you were getting out there that must have been very difficult uh during a pandemic time which of course we're still experiencing now um did you were you met with much resistance as you got out in the community um at first no right now is where i see the difficult uh push um i think that a lot of people had questions um, and we're hesitant to get the vaccine at first. Um, and I just want to let you know, I gave out my personal cell phone number and my personal email number. So I was getting contacted by people all over the state of Vermont and Mass in New York um, to try to figure out more information about the vaccine. So all of the information that I used to help educate came from the WHO, the CDC, and the Vermont Department of Health. Um, and, you know, some people would FaceTime me, some people would call me, some people would uh, video chat on WhatsApp, um, email back and forth, um, and we would just have plain conversations. So, um, you know, what's your favorite thing to eat for dinner, or what what do you guys like to do? What do you guys do way up there in the Northeast Kingdom? Or, yeah, um, it's it's we still got some snow here. Um, I hate shoveling. And then and then once you build a relationship with someone, you're able to have the difficult conversation of um, needing to understand the benefits of getting the COVID vaccine, whether it be Pfizer, Moderna, or um, Johnson & Johnson. Yeah, establishing that connection and then uh, the familiarity that comes with those conversations is what leads to trust. And, mm -hmm. and that goes beyond this topic. This is just life lessons. And I think it takes a lot of work to do what you both are doing and what your groups are doing. And I applaud you for it uh, because it would be easy to see these uh, problems, these disparities, and sort of make note of them and then move on to the next thing because we're all busy. And um, and you took the time and you are taking the time to go out and make a difference. And, and also I have to say another thing that can um, be a, almost a turnoff is, well, we have a low population overall in Vermont of anybody. We hardly have anybody here, 600. 20,000 people. So everything we talk about has small volumes and small numbers, and, and we may not think that uh, they're so important, but in reality, they're incredibly important, and they're what make our state uh, unique and able to be nimble during times like this and, and react. So um, so as we sort of close up here, I, of course, I want to have you guys back if you don't mind. There's so many other things that I'd love to talk about, maybe check in in six months and see uh, what's going on and, and for all of us who knows what we'll be looking at in six months with uh, this pandemic um, but let me just close with a, a couple of questions i'll start with caitlin uh, what major shifts do you think uh, are necessary in healthcare, society uh, the government uh, health institutions themselves to deliver care in a more equitable way across groups I think one of the shifts that I'm already starting to see in, in healthcare is the shift from sort of the fact that equal and equitable are not synonymous. Mm -hmm. um, what's best for me is not necessarily best for you. And so, um, I, yeah, and I think that that's, that's a really big culture shift um, and I'm starting to see it happen already. And I see that happening 
in our community and in our healthcare system. Um, and so that right there tells me that the work that we do is going to get easier because people get it. Um, I will say, you know, Patty mentioned our diversity, equity, and inclusion committee, and that started with um, four of us, three nurses and a nurse practitioner. Um, it's a committee of over 45 members now. Um, and it's one of those things where we started out and sort of everything felt like this insurmountable task. Like this is such a big thing to take on and how are we ever going to accomplish it? And then you start looking back and seeing all of the different things that you have been able to achieve. Um, and so I see that shift already happening here. I think at a higher level, I think there's converse, there, you know, health equity and health inequities are, are really big topics right now. Um, I feel like every single medical conference that I've attended in the past couple of years always has like this health equity track running through it. And even if it's not an intentional thing, those are the topics that are coming up because that's the that's what is impacting our our population in this country. Um, and I think the pandemic has just kind of widened those gaps. And that doesn't that doesn't just apply to the BIPOC community. That applies to everything. I think this topic in particular is a little bit difficult for people in Bennington to kind of wrap their head around because we don't have a huge population of black people and indigenous people that they know of. And so then you start looking at intersectionality of identities. And um, I think that's the important part that I kind of have to shift that lens a little bit for people mm -hmm. to understand why this is a big deal and why it's really important to address. Because you start thinking like, okay, I do, I actually do know somebody who lost their job during the pandemic and all of the subsequent hardships that, that kind of have impacted them since that point in time. And um, you start thinking about, like, you make it relatable. And I think that's the challenge in, in this nation is that we've been so divided that people are so on one side or the other. It's not about us versus them. It's about how do we kind of come together and impact a change. And I think that that, I, I mean, I'm speaking for myself, but I feel like we're finally kind of getting to that point um, as a community, as a nation where it doesn't always feel so unrestful and that people are kind of starting to come together to work towards the same thing. Um, and so I think that's the biggest shift that I see needing to happen and it's already in progress. So that's really promising. And it's excellent. I, I love what you um, have said there and what you led with. And let me just say, um, you know, I talked about social maturation, which you just explained that uh, society maturing to a point uh, where things that years ago were, were normal are, are no longer uh, by any means um, accepted. But I tell you what, what sometimes hurts and, and it's hard to keep moving uh, and you, you do such a great job, uh, the two of you and, and your groups that you lead, and that is it's not just three steps forward and then three steps forward. It's three steps forward, two steps back, and sometimes it's four steps back. And and it's, that's just disheartening, it's discouraging. Um, we've seen that over the past 10 years through um, social uh, movements, and so I applaud you keep pushing forward. Uh, I think medicine is well positioned to keep pushing forward, even if there's other forces that may be uh, in opposition. But let me just close by asking Patty one, one last question. Patty, um, how are you measuring success today with the work that you all are doing? Success is measured for me on an individual basis. Mm. My parents, uh, are my biggest support system. And if we can just make someone feel better about a choice or help someone get to a better opportunity, we're successful. That's um, great. And, and that's, it's, it's totally individualized. Um, they're from the deep South. So they have, um, a lot of Southern, uh, charm and, uh, that has, has come through in my values and morals. And so it's just treating people how you want to be treated. Um, people will never forget how you uh, make them feel. Uh, so just always be kind, um, support one another, direct communication, um, and everything's going to be okay. I'm, I'm very hopeful that um, we, with, with all of us working together, um, we will overcome all of these uh, disparities and, and get things shifted in the right direction. We're already, we're already started. 
we're already started. Well, we'll end there on such a positive note. Thank you both for joining us today on Medical Matters Weekly. Um, I'd also like to thank CAT TV, Ray Smith from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, and Ashley Gallant from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. And next week, we will have Tim Van Orden, who is an elite athlete, a writer, speaker, and nutrition advocate. I'm Trey Dobson. Go out and find joy in everything you do, even in the face of adversity, and we will see you next week.